Welcome to the VBF Vegas Online Service. My name is Jim Cruz. I'm the lead pastor here at VBF. And let me just say on behalf of all of us, thank you for downloading or streaming this service. I pray that it's going to touch your heart and change your life. In addition to bringing you today's service, we want to make ourselves available to you in any way we can. Please leave us a comment if you need prayer, if you want to speak to one of our pastors and maybe a struggle you're currently going through. We want to be sure to respond to anything you need from us. And here at VBF, we believe that we should never forsake the gathering together with other believers. Don't use this online service as your church experience. Get involved in the local church to the extent that people there actually know your name. If you aren't yet currently involved in a local church, we strongly encourage you to at least join one of our online live groups that meet weekly via Google Hangouts. And this will give you the personal encouragement you need to stay strong in your faith. And check out our live group page on our website for a list of days and times these online groups meet. Finally, there's a lot of man hours that are put behind making services and resources like this available that are meant to really help you grow and develop as a disciple of Jesus. So if this service or our other resources bless you, would you consider giving back to VBF Vegas to support not just these things, but to also support the creation of even more resources for you and really for others who are also desiring to grow in their faith? To make a financial donation, simply click on the link on our site that says donate and your gift of any amount is so greatly appreciated. Remember, when you give to VBF Vegas, you're actually giving through VBF Vegas to change lives in our church, in our city, and literally around the world. We've already prayed for you that today's message would speak directly to your heart and empower you to live the life God has called you to live. Enjoy the service. Amen. Amen. Thanks, bro, so much, man. Yeah. Uh, if you have your Bibles, uh, go ahead and open to uh, Hosea chapter 3. And uh, for those of you that may be new, maybe you're visiting, anyone visiting from out of town for the holiday? Anybody? All right, good thing you're here and not on the, the road, right? Because that's crazy traffic leaving here. Uh, but we are so excited to finish up this series. We've been talking about the book of Hosea, and the book of Hosea is just really neat little book uh it talks about this man of god that was told by god that he was going to marry a promiscuous woman so so god had given him foreknowledge that he was going to marry her they were going to have kids they're going to have this family and then she was going to skip out on him and start pursuing a different kind of lifestyle and at some given point he was going to have to go and rescue her and bring her back and then they would be together once again and God told Hosea you're going to do this as a picture of how I feel towards Israel the nation and that even though I continue to love them and I continue to pursue them they continue to wander off and they continue to put themselves over in things that are not good for their lives and I'm going to I'm going to show them through you Hosea that no matter what they do no matter what kind of mess they've made I'm going to continue to run after them and I'm going to continue to pursue them that's the message of Hosea so we're going to be in chapter 3 tonight and we're, let me just read verse 1 as we conclude Hosea it says then the Lord told me love your wife again even though she is loved by others and has committed Adultery, Love her as I, the Lord, love the Israelites. Even though they have turned to other gods and love to eat pumpkin pie. I have to change that because that just sounds like it's like Whole Foods, like raisin cakes. This sounds too healthy. Um, have some organic raisin cakes. Like pumpkin pie. Now that's tempting. I'm not going to be tempted by raisin cakes. Get raisin cakes out of my face. Give me some pumpkin pie. You know, I, this is a true story. Uh, my wife sent me this week on the mission to get a couple pumpkin, or, or get, not, not pumpkin pies specifically, but to go to Marie Callender's on the day before Thanksgiving to pick up two pies. Now, we didn't order them ahead of time. I guess you can order your pies ahead of time. We didn't do that. So there was a walk-in line on this side and the pre-order line on this side. So I went a walk-in line, long line, and I'm thinking to myself, like, we didn't order ahead of time. We're getting nothing. I mean, they're not even going to have pumpkin pie. So we're in line, and I'm, you know, talking to people. And I finally get up there, and I'm like, okay, so what do you have left? And she turned around, and she showed me this board. And there were like 20 
different pies on the board. She goes, we have all of those still. I said, what? She goes, yeah, we have all of them. I go, I'm supposed to get two. I learned a lesson. Never go and pick up pies when you're hungry. Because then I'm like, I don't want just two. <laughs> Tell me which ones. And she goes, well, we have this apple pie. It's really good. I go, okay, I'll have that one. And she goes, well, we have this like berry pie. I go, yeah, that sounds really good too. And pumpkin, oh yeah, pumpkin pie. Uh, and then we have this chocolate cream pie. And I go, yeah, that, that's awesome, yeah. She goes, but then there's another chocolate cream pie. It's got like an Oreo crust. We call it chocolate satin pie. And I go, yes, 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 and yes. I walked out of there with three bags of pies. And I got home and my wife goes, what are those? And I go, they're pies. She goes, I told you to get two. I go, I know. But they all look good. I even had them throw in a key lime pie. I have way too many pies. But I tell you, that chocolate satin pie, I renamed chocolate Satan pie. Because I ate one piece and then another and then another. And then I, I'm not going to confess how many pieces I ate. But I may have eaten the whole thing. I'm not, I'm not sure if I did or not. But... But that's another sermon. But I, I, I just, I look at this idea because what we've been talking about is that it's human nature to take what's familiar and to let those things depreciate in value for our lives. And, and when we allow those things that we love and value depreciate, other things start looking more attractive and more valuable. This is why I, I circled last week. I said, we love our families more than anyone in this world, but yet we will treat a perfect stranger nicer than we do our own family members. Why? Because what's familiar tends to get depreciated in value. And so we learned that in order to stay away from that, we need to appreciate the things that value to our lives. So what happens with Hosea and Gomer is this family that she has depreciates and she starts chasing other things, other men, other lifestyles. And God says, that's just like the human spirit. Because this isn't a story about God and Israel. This is about a story about God and humanity. And we have this propensity that once we get in a place where something looks more valuable, we will drop whatever it is that we're involved in and we will start chasing after other things that look more desirable. Question, what is your raisin cake? What is it that has got you and lured you away from the place that God wants you to be at? Because just because something looks good to you doesn't mean it is good for you. So there are a lot of times the raisin cakes come up in our life, the, the chocolate Satan pies that come in our life, and they look good, but they have all these promises on the front end but what they have on the back end is they have, a lot of times, attachments. And for H Hosea and Gomer, Gomer's lifestyle caught up to her and she was trapped in the sex slave industry. She was stripped away of all the things that she had that was once good and wholesome for her life. And she's there, she's in slavery. She's away from this man of God and her children. And now Hosea is being told by God, go find her, Hosea. Go find your wife again. Love her again. Now see, some of you, you immediately have this thought in your mind like, man, if somebody did that to me, I would drop them like a bad habit. I'd be like, hey, it, you know, fool me once, you know, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. It's like, that's how we treat it. And, and a lot of times, we project how we would treat another human being on how God treats us. And that's a fatal mistake. There's so many people around this world that think that God is out to get them. That they've messed up one too many times. That they won't step foot into church because they think that God will strike them dead when they come through the threshold. They're like, no thanks, I'm not going to church. But that's not the heart of God at all. And the story of Hosea is to counteract this human tendency to project how we would treat another human being about how God would treat us. 
Because God, this story isn't about how we're prone to wandering. This story isn't about how we give ourselves over the raisin cakes. This is a story about no matter how many times we chase after the raisin cakes and get chained up and stripped away, God is on a mission to pursue us and He refuses to give up on us no matter how messy, no matter how smelly we are. That's the message of the gospel. Matter of fact, Jesus comes along and he says, I want to put an exclamation point on the story of Hosea. And he tells his own story about this man who had a father that had a lot of money. And this man decided, this young man, he said, I want my inheritance now. The tradition is once a father dies, you get the inheritance. But this young man said, I I want my inheritance now. And he made this self Center decision to go to his dad and ask for it and the dad gave it to him have you ever made a self-centered decision that you later regretted this is where this son was at this is where this man was at and he ends up taking this wealth that his father gave him and he squandered it, the bible says he it, it, he just lost it all put it all on black and it was red it was gone And then he ends up with no job and he has no money. So one job opening was there and he took it. And for a Jewish person, this was like the insult of insults. He worked on a pig farm. And he was there and he's taking care of the pigs. And if you've ever taken care of pigs, they are the smelliest creature, I'm convinced, on the face of this earth. I was around this pig farm for just 10 minutes and I couldn't get the odor out of my nostrils all day long. I had that smell in there. And he's there. Jesus is telling the story about this man that is there at the pig farm. And he starts dreaming about what it would be like to go and live with his father again. Thinking about the amazing ways that his father lives and and the place that he lives. He goes, you know, even if I was a servant, even if I became a slave, being a slave in my father's house is going to allow me to be in a better position than I'm at now. So he finally gets the courage and he's going back to his father's house to confess and expect probably a lashing. I mean, that lecture, you know, this is the teaching moment. The dad's like, I told you. And you know what? I can't believe you did this, son. You go over here. He was expecting to be chewed out. But he goes anyway. He's like, I'll take it on the chin and at least I'll have a better lifestyle. But this is what happens in verse 20 of Luke 15. It says this, it says, So he returned home to his father. And while he was still a long way off, I love that. He wasn't even close to the house. See, some of you, you feel like that in your relationship with God, in your pursuit of God. You're like, you know, I feel like I'm a long way off. Join the club here. And his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion. Doesn't say filled with wrath and anger, does it? Filled with love and compassion. He ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. The picture of God is not a God that wants to push you away and beat you up. The picture of God is when you start making one step toward heaven, God is running toward you to say, welcome home. It's about time. I've been pursuing you. I've been chasing you. And now you're home. Let's have a party. That's the heart of God. And that is the story of Hosea. Isaiah 55 says this let the wicked leave their way of life and change their way of thinking let them turn to the lord our god he is merciful and what quick to forgive stop projecting how you would treat other human beings on how god treats you and start projecting on other human beings the way god treats you you're going to be so much more quick to forgive other people when they offend you because of your knowledge of how much God has forgiven you and all the ways that you've offended him. Does that make sense? Are you still with me? Five o'clock service. I don't know. You're quiet on me. I don't know if you're in mourning because the Broncos lost. But but I'm telling you, the 1130 service was a lot more into this than you guys. You're disappointing me tonight. All right? So, but, but let's go to verse two. So, This is Hosea. So I bought her for 23 ounces of silver and 10 
bushels of barley. What was that like? What was that like? That's his wife. I mean, you guys understand the concept, don't you? That when you get married, it's not like, yeah, you know, I own them. That's not how it is. We know that the Bible says when, when two people come together, they become one flesh. Paul says that your body is not your own. So the husband belongs to the wife and the wife belongs to the husband. They, you possess one another. Hosea possessed Gomer. That, that was his wife. Can you imagine that moment? He finds her. He finally finds her. And imagine the places that he had to go to look for her. But he never gave up. And he finally finds her. And she's for sale. And I can imagine in that moment, he's like, but that's my wife. And whoever it is that's selling her says, I don't care who you think she is. That'll be $23.59. Visa, MasterCard, American Express. I don't know how they did. But in that moment, Hosea is realizing, even though she belongs to me, there's a price that needs to be paid to set her free. So I'll pay the money. And he pays the money, and she becomes free again. The chains fall off. The clothes come back on. And he's able to be with his bride again. I don't know what kind of misconceptions you painted in your mind about God but he is in love with you and he is in relentless pursuit of you you might be messy you might smell like pig farm I don't know but I don't care how messy you are or how smelly you become you cannot keep the love of God from pursuing you because you're his see here's the unique role with Hosea and Gomer it's a picture of us later on it says in the end (laughs) it says in the end there that that there will come a time at the end of the age that there will be a King David that will rise up and in that moment there will be a fresh new anointing and there will be a fear of his goodness not a, not a fear of his wrath, but a fear of his goodness. Folks, we're in the last days. And our Hosea has come. His name is Jesus. And he's bought us back. We've been chained up. We've been stripped away. And we've been held back from the relationship that God has always wanted with us. But the cross has given us the price. And the price has been paid. And all we have to do is say yes to something that has already been done. That's where we're at. And I don't mean to offend you, but we're Gomer. We've chased the rice cakes. And some of those rice cakes, they bit us hard and they chained us up and they stripped us away. And they've left us broken. They've left left us in this place of, of feeling suffocated like there's no way out. And Jesus shows up and says, with me, there's always a way out. And I've come to set you free so that you can be in relationship with me. And because that's what God desires more than anything. You know, God has a love language, church. His love language is quality time. It's right in Hosea. Check this out. Hosea chapter 6. Hosea 6. I want your constant love, not your animal sacrifices. I would rather have my people know me than burn offerings to me. Jesus paid the price to set you free so that you can have relationship with God again. He doesn't want religiosity. He he doesn't want you just to be going through the motions to be this religious person. He wants you, his bride. And he wants you to come close to him. He says, hey, you know, yeah, reading the Bible and studying the Bible is great. But don't base everything on studying the Bible and knowing your Greek and Hebrew if that means that you don't spend time with me. I'll tell you, I've met some very, very, very smart people that know the Bible, that know scriptures, that have things memorized, that can tell me words in the Greek and words in the Hebrew. But these same people are the most mean people I've ever met in my life. And they have the name Christian over their lives. But I also know people that help the poor and take care of those that are in need, that don't even know God. They're just doing it because 
They just want to be a good human being. So you can read the Bible, you can study scripture, you can do good deeds, but that doesn't mean you're right with God. To be right with God means that you are in a right relationship with God. Martha and Mary were two sisters that hung out with Jesus a lot. And one time they were hosting Jesus over their house. And of course, you can imagine Jesus is in your living room like everybody's in the living room like listening to Jesus do a teaching. And Martha slipped out of the kitchen and she's there at the feet of Jesus. And Martha's, or Mary's there. And Martha's like doing the dishes and she's like, hey man, I'm doing all this work myself. And she comes in and sees her sister at the feet of Jesus. And she says, Jesus, you're going to let her sit there? I'm hosting this party. I'm stressed out. I need some help in the kitchen. And she's expecting Jesus to take her side and tell Mary, hey, get up and go help your sister. He looks at Martha and says, Martha, Martha, Martha. You need to take note of what your sis is doing here because what she's doing is way more important than doing dishes. Way more important. God's love language is you and him being together. Not acts of service, even though those things are good. It, it's, it's not gift giving. Those things are awesome. And I'm not taking anything away. But if you want to appreciate the fact that God went and he bought you back. Even though you are, were already his possession. He bought you back even when you didn't deserve it. When you were messy and smelly, he bought you back. If you want to appreciate God, the way you appreciate God is you conform to his love language. And he wants you to be with him. And I told you last week, that's how, that's how come we worship. It's because worship is our way that we get into the presence of God and just hang out with him. If you haven't signed up already, get in the 40 days of prayer campaign. Sign up for an hour slot. Get into that prayer room. I'm telling you, miracles are going to take place in your life. Breakthroughs, breakthroughs are going to happen. But more than any of that, you're going to feel the love of God in your life like you've never felt it before. Because that's what happens when you hang out in the presence of God. And that's all he wants from us. He just wants to be with us. Some of you, it's time to stop running away from God. And it's time to start going towards God. And he's going to run down the drive when he's going to meet you. Would you bow your heads? Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you, God, for this strong word in Hosea and this whole series. And there's so many things in our life that we just take for granted, God. We don't want the cross to ever be one of those things. That you gave your son, your one and only son, to purchase us back. The creation that already belonged to you in the first place. But that was the only way for us to really truly be set free. God, my prayer is that everyone here would accept the greatest gift that the world has ever known. The gift of your son that paid for us to be set free. And some of you that are in shackles tonight, some of you that have been stripped of all the things that you knew to be good for your life that's been taken from you because you've spent your life chasing the raisin cakes in your life. You know, God is here tonight to not just give you a new chapter of your life. God is here tonight so that you can be born again, so that you can have life completely brand new not a new chapter we're talking a new book church and he's here tonight and he's saying are you ready for me i'm ready to take you home tonight i'm ready to have a relationship with you and if you've never made that decision would you just raise your hand right where you're sitting and say pastor would you pray for me i know that's where i'm at i, I want to be set free tonight I, I want jesus in my life just raise your hand some of you have been running. Maybe you made that decision, but somehow you got lured away and the raisin cakes got you and here you are. You know Jesus, just like Gomer no Hosea, but you ran from him and today God is calling you back home. Maybe you're like the prodigal son. You've been away from the place that God wants you at. You've been in this terrible life situation and you know you got yourself there. Nobody else got you there. You're poor self-centered decisions got you there and now God's saying are you ready to come live again with me 
He's not going to give you wrath and anger. He's going to give you love and compassion to come home. If you've been running from God and you know this is your call to run to God tonight, would you just raise your hand and say, you know what, Pastor, that's me. God bless you guys. God bless you guys. I want us to pray this prayer together, church. For those that raise their hand and for those that are even thinking in their hearts about your relationship with God, I want this to be a declaration. Would you just pray this prayer for me? Say, Jesus, tonight I thank you for paying for my release, for setting me free from myself in all the ways that I wander away and the raisin cakes that I chase after that do nothing but chain me up and strip me down. Tonight I declare that I want to follow you and I want to come home to you. Forgive me of my sin and fill me with your spirit so that I can walk in your power and live the life that you've called me to live in relationship with you. I want to appreciate you, God. I never want to take the cross for granted. And tonight I'm here to do just that. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you just stand to your feet? We're going to end with a worship song tonight, church. And I brought a magnifying glass because this is, this is why we worship. We don't worship because we're here to tell God, Oh God, you're so lovely. And God's in heaven going, Man, I was kind of feeling down. I needed somebody to kind of affirm me. God, God doesn't need our words of affirmation. Our souls need to be reminded of the greatness and the glory of God. Because our souls get a little apathetic and they fall asleep to this. You see, we all have a magnifying glass, but we live our lives like this most of the time. We're magnifying what's what's down here. These are our problems. These are the things that are that are challenges. These are the issues. And we keep magnifying and we got anxiety and we think like there's no way I'm going to be able to handle this. And we keep looking at these things and they keep getting bigger and bigger. And God says, what are you doing? Worship isn't just about me and you coming together in the presence. Worship is about reminding your soul of who I am in your life. Psalm 34, 1 says, oh, magnify the Lord. Oh, magnify the Lord. He doesn't need to be created larger than he already is. But all he's saying is take your magnifying glass and stop looking down and start looking up and saying, God, you are greater than my issues. You are bigger than my problems. And I will stop letting these things suffocate me. And I'm going to give them over to you and let you, let you control those. So church tonight, let's appreciate the cross. Let's appreciate Jesus. Let's appreciate that God is greater than your problems. And he is stronger than your issues. And let's worship him in spirit and in truth. Raise your voices. Let's worship.
this is what it means to be in relationship with God. Church, spend time with them. Worship Him. Worship isn't just about singing. It's about being in the presence of God through maybe other believers gathering in a life group. It, it might mean just, you know, just sitting in your car before you go in to your family and just saying, God, I just want to hang out with you. It may just be in complete silence as you drive home from work tomorrow, but just be in the presence of God. The presence of God is anywhere you want it to be. God says, I will not leave you or forsake you. I'm right, I'm right there with you. So God bless you guys. You are-